So I'm Jeff Grunvalds, and I was born in Nebraska, a small town um, called Wahoo. I lived in Utan most of my life, which is near Omaha, which is the biggest city in Nebraska. And then I moved to Latvia three years ago, and I've been living here and doing various types of jobs and kind of getting by in my new homeland. So that's where I'm from. Hey Jeff. Hi Mara. How are you? How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for joining us and sharing a little bit of your story today. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so um, I know you've been in Latvia for about three years and we'll get to that part a little bit later in our conversation, but I'm wondering if you can start with um, letting us in a little bit about where you grew up and what that was like. So where, um, where you lived, where you were born, mm -hmm. um, what the people were like there, what it looks like. Tell us a little bit. So I grew up in Nebraska and uh, fun part about moving to Latvia is you say you're from the States and they know like four states, but nobody ever knows Nebraska. So I have to show it to them. It's right in the middle of the country. And most people think of cowboys or cows or farms um, called a flyover state. Uh, and I grew up in a really, really small town in that small state. So my dad was a pastor and I was the youngest of seven growing up in this small town with immigrant parents from Latvia. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting childhood. I didn't know uh, much about like politics or economics or anything like that. Grew up very ignorant to all that. But looking back, you know, we were poor and we lived in kind of a poor town. And, uh, and so that was... Uh, that was kind of my upbringing. I graduated in a class of 26 people in my graduating oh, wow. class. Really yeah. small. <laughs> yeah, really small, so. And um, and what are the people like in the middle of Nebraska? So the US is so big, how would you describe people from your area of Nebraska, where you're from? So Nebraska is well known for being one of the friendliest states. We have the Nebraska Cornhuskers and people come from all over the country or they used to when we had a good football team. And that was one of the things that our opponents would always say was that when they came to Lincoln, Nebraska and they watched the games, even though we were rivals and we were against each other, all the Nebraskans, hey, how you doing? La, la, la. You know, very, very friendly, um, outgoing, uh, Christian, lots of churches, lots of uh, Protestants. Um, Let's see, there's the joke, I'm, I'm sure every state has the same joke, but every small town has two churches and two bars or an equal number of bars and churches and that was kind of how our town was. Um, my class was kind of split. We had a bedroom community. So you had the old farmer kids whose parents had farms and they grew up in the agricultural world. And then other families whose parents worked in Omaha and they just lived in Utah as a bedroom community. So it was kind of a mix of, of those kinds of people. So um, yeah, the people are friendly. The people are uh, definitely conservative in terms of politics and social uh, social things, but kind hearted for the most part. And part of what I was picking up on when you were saying friendly is that it sounds like people say things that indicate friendliness. So they're like opening up conversation and starting conversation with you. Is that part of how, if they, like if how they it know comes you. out? Yeah, if they, yeah, yeah, you know, the typical loud American, that's Nebraska for you, we have the, hey, how you doing? Hey, good to see you. Hey, how are you doing? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, mostly insincere, you know, those, the typical greetings like, hey, how's it going? They don't really want to know. It's just very open and, and, and friendly. Um, so yeah, definitely that open, open, broad gestures and those sorts of things. Mm, so open, but a little more superficial unless they know you a bit more. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You, you get that a big burst of kindness, but you know, what's underneath that you don't know. So definitely on the outside, everybody's really nice. Yeah, yeah. And having grown up uh, basically a, a state away from you, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I hear you on that. It's, it's the, you'll get it, but you don't know if you'll get more than that. It depends on the situation. Absolutely. And part of, I think what's interesting with your story is that your 
culturally, ethnically Latvian, but didn't live in Latvia until a few years ago. So I'm wondering, mm-hmm. growing up in Nebraska with, you know, a Latvian family, what did Latvian culture look like to you when you were living there? And, and or like, what did your parents impart to you was Latvian culture? What a great question. That's a fun question. So I grew up, um, luckily we had, my mom was the youngest of nine and I said I was the youngest of seven. My dad was basically the only one in his family in the United States. He left everyone behind, but my mom's whole family came from Latvia to the United States. So growing up, we were surrounded by Latvian aunts and uncles, all my mom's family, and we would gather in these huge 30, 40 people gathering, all speaking Latvian and Latvian food and Latvian songs and and all those sorts of things. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't speak the language and all these people were much older than I was. So I didn't really get a lot of the the Latvian-ness. But the things we grew up with and considered Latvian, like we were all kind of crazy and loud and funny and like that sort of thing. We thought that was a Latvian thing because our whole family was like that. And we didn't Um, especially in our small town of conservative, kind of the American conservative thing. Um, We didn't have any boundaries. We didn't know boundaries. And so we we got in a lot of trouble with that because of uh, because of that. And I I thought it was a Latvian thing. I thought, oh, we're just Latvians. We're crazy because that's what Latvians are. So that was a that was one thing. Um, Definitely the food. My mom uh, cooked traditional Latvian dishes like uh, uh, beet leaf soup and uh, fricadere soup and pea dogs and, and those sorts of things. And my dad was a great cook too. He never cooked for the family, but he liked to cook meals for himself that were very ethnic. Um, uh, bread was his big thing. He made uh my whole life. Every Friday, he would make two loaves of rupmais and oh, wow. we'd take one to the family's house and he would take one, keep one home, and then we would eat uh, lork mice and and svest mice and things like that on the rye bread. And people would come to our house and they would love to eat like the things my dad would make and the things my mom would make because it was different from anything else. And when I I was probably the of all of the siblings, I was probably the most interested in Latvia, which is weird because I'm the youngest. And so you think my older brothers and sisters who actually spoke Latvian and grew up with much more of the uh, Latvian kind of lifestyle would have been more interested, but I was just fascinated by it uh, all my life. I grew up and I was like, I wanted to know more about it. And I would press my mom to teach me Latvian and, and look it up in the encyclopedia and read about it and follow the whole Soviet uh, saga and all that. Um, and when I was 16, I did a speech on Latvia, an informative speech for contest, and I made it to the state contest, and I brought pea dogs for all the judges to eat, and uh, <laughs> um, I think that's why I won uh, the tournaments that I won. So that was just a, it was a fun experience, and I had the map of Latvia and, and showed everybody, and it was interesting because, you know, then it was part of the Soviet Union, and nobody even knew it as a separate country and I would give the speech about it being its own thing and, and that was kind of fun for me to, to share. In one of my uh, contests one of the girls was a Swedish uh, uh, exchange student and she saw the map and Sweden was on the map and she came up and we had a little conversation about how it was close to Sweden and that sort of thing so that was really uh, nice for me to, to kind of have that experience. I'm curious if you don't mind sharing what the context was as to I, I guess what your parents' thoughts were as to why you didn't learn Latvian. Was it because there wasn't a Latvian community immediately surrounding you? Was it because they didn't have time? What was... Um, my dad was very hands-off in terms of uh, being a father figure. Like he was a pastor and he was all business all the time. And my mom basically told me that you're not smart enough to learn it. It's too hard. That was kind oh, of her goodness. approach. Yeah. <laughs> Because she would, yeah, she just thought it was too hard. She gave me some little notes here and there, like uh, some words and things like that. But I really had to kind of like tell, you know, just start teaching me. And then after my mom passed and my dad came to live with me and I decided to go visit Latvia and live in Latvia, I, my dad and I had some lessons where my cousin uh, Giannis or John Grimberg would come over and teach me some Latvian and dad would sit at the table and kind of listen in and make some remarks. He was really good with grammar and he was an A student or a five student or whatever, however they measured it here in, in uh, Latvian. And so he would kind of correct John and, and give me some notes about what to expect and this sort of thing. But neither of them were really hands-on when it came to that. 
my oldest siblings just spoke it naturally because it's what my parents spoke. But I think, I don't know, this is just kind of a theory. I mean, I think they really just wanted to fit in. We we're in a small town and everybody spoke English and, and just being Latvian, being foreigners was outsider enough. And I don't think they wanted that for me. So that's my theory. I can't prove it, but that's kind of the idea I have. I think it's a reasonable theory. I, a lot of Latvians I've met in the States either come from, it feels like families decided to be at one end of the spectrum or the other. So either they super, everything was in Latvian all the time and you mm -hmm. weren't allowed to do anything else or it was the opposite. Like yeah. we're Americans now, we need to fit in here. Mm -hmm. No language, no Latvian school, no nothing like that. But it also mm -hmm. sounds like you weren't necessarily other than your giant family, you weren't necessarily um, close to a bigger networked Latvian community where there no. was a Latvian school or anything like no, that. No, not at all. When I meet you, when I met you and Ivette and a couple other Latvian Americans who have lived here, I was just so jealous because you guys grew up with this whole experience. And I didn't even know about that until my dad retired in like 92 and started working at the Latvian church in Lincoln. And that's where they would have Latvian language classes on Saturday. And they had this Latvian Sunday school and they had these Latvian events that we started going to and learning about. I'm already, you know, in my twenties and I'm like, why didn't we do this when we were growing up? Why didn't we do this all the time? We could have been a part of this, this community. And, uh, and I don't know, I think my dad just always, he loved it. Like he would go to uh, get his ours and, and go to these church events and do it, but he never, I think he just didn't think we would be interested or, I don't know. I'm not sure what his motive was. Um, you said something else I wanted to, to comment on. Oh yeah, my cousin, uh, John Grimbergs. He actually changed his name when he got to America. He changed it to Grimberg and dropped the S. And I didn't realize that until I was much older. And I said, why did you take the S up? He said, because we're in America and I wanted to, to have an American name, even though it's Grimberg and it's <laughs> not American sounding at all, but still he, he got the, rid of the S so he wouldn't have that uh, extra letter. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But he's yeah. still pretty, I mean, he sings Latvian songs and he, his daughter came to Latvia and, and uh, did an exchange program here. So it's not like he erased his heritage, I, but, but that was an interesting detail about him. And I think it's, it's interesting to hear different stories of how families that aren't originally from places, how they immigrant families adjust to situations because it's all, it's all very different from one another and kind of like what's, right. what's kept and how it's kept and how those stories are told and, and then kind of what's discarded or maybe doesn't feel as important anymore. And so when did you first come to Latvia and what was the context around that? And what was that like? So that was amazing. That was uh, 2005. And I had a friend who was stationed in Germany and he invited us to visit them. And so I said, well, if we're gonna fly to Germany, let's see how much it costs to go to Latvia. And it turned out it was like 99, or something like that at the time to go from Germany to Latvia. I said, well, let's, let's do that for a few days. And I still had cousins here. And back then it was before like, you know, this easy internet and how you could reach people. And I don't remember, I must have emailed Ansys somehow gotten his email and said, we're thinking of coming to Latvia and, and this and that. And so he's, you know, it sounded like a great idea and they had a place for us to stay. So uh, that would be great. And so we arranged that. And um, so we did a three day, it was really quick. Um, we flew in and then we stayed, I think two nights and then we flew out back to Germany. And in that time um, we stayed, it was, I, I made a whole video about it cause it was funny how we got there. Like, so we, I didn't have his phone number. I didn't have a phone. I don't think that would work in Latvia anyway. Um, we had this email where we said, well, we'll be flying in. And I sent him the flight date time number and uh hadn't seen him didn't know what he looked like never met him didn't know this guy at all and uh, i get to the airport we're in latvia and i'm like okay let's just hope and pray that somebody shows up and uh and he showed up and and he he brought us in his car and uh he drove us to uh to the to the apartment which is in the silent center which you get you start living here and you're like oh that's a really upscale 
place we were staying at. But at the time I had no idea, you know, it was like post-Soviet, I didn't know what to expect. And so we get on these dark streets and we're driving to this, this house and he has to go through this metal gate and, and park his car in this back lot, the Pog Alms. And uh, one key to open the gate, one key to open the back door, key to open the apartment. We go up this like these steps that are kind of dirty and dark, and just felt like, oh no, what do we get into? We're gonna go to this. Oh, it's gonna be like, <laughs> what is this gonna be like? And then he opens the door to the flat, and it's just this glorious modern apartment with all modern amenities, and everything is beautiful and shiny, and, and it's just like, wow, this is gonna be great. So. And then we spent basically, oh, that was a cool trip because we met, uh, so we stayed in Riga. And then the next day we drove to um, Mira, 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 Mary, Mary, um, which is a super tiny town. My dad grew up in Smiltene, but his sister lived in Mary. She was a school teacher there for lots of years. And he told her that we would come and visit in Mary. And I asked the address and there was no address. And my dad said, when you get there, just ask for uh, Austria Grimbalde and, and they'll know where she mm -hmm. lives. I'm like, I, I can not speak any Latvian. I, this is gonna be crazy. And this is a time, I don't know, uh, you came a lot in the nineties and whatever, but people told me like the police will be watching for you because you're American and they're gonna pull you over. So I have 50 lots in your pocket to pay them off because they don't care. They just want payment. So I was terrified to drive anywhere and, and all these, they told me all these stories, but we drove and um, we get to Maddie and uh, no clue. Like we drove around like, it's, maybe six houses in this town, it's a tiny little town. And we drove around, I'm like, I don't see anybody to ask. I don't have any idea what to do. And then we go by this house and there's some people in the driveway and it looks like maybe they're our cousins, I don't know. And we pulled in and the Jeffrey, oh! it was <laughs> just, they were expecting us. And so I met uh, my aunt who I'd never met, her husband, Giannis, um, they're, they're, uh, my cousin Giannis, who was, uh, he came to America. So I'd met him before. And then their uh, niece, Gitta, who spoke some English, and she was basically the translator who, who, who carried everything, carried the whole conversation. But the coolest thing about getting to Maddie was um, the house is tiny. And my aunt, Austra, cooked a whole meal on old wood stove. I could not believe it. Like, she had old wood stove, no running water, a pump in the kitchen. Uh, the toilet was, what do you call them, a dry toilet or whatever they call them mm -hmm. here, like in the house, but still there's uh, no real running water or anything. And she's living like that in 2005. Like this was really how she lived this, this life. And um, then we get outside to her backyard. She had a honeycombs with bees and apple trees and just the most beautiful uh, yard I'd ever seen. And in her house, she had like books piled up all over and these tapestries and cloths and, and dishes and things. And it looked exactly like my aunt's house in Blair, Nebraska. Like it was like oh, walking wow. into, and then I, I was thinking like all the Latvian houses of my older Latvian aunts and uncles, this is how they felt. And so it was so neat to see this kind of, this same countryside culture carried over in America. I don't think they thought they were being Latvian, but it was exactly the same feeling mm -hmm. um, to go to those houses. So we spent the day there and that was an amazing experience to meet my uh, my dad's sister. And uh, and I'm so happy I did because uh, they're all gone now. So it was just this touchstone to a, a world I hadn't known. And the, and the thing she was most upset about, like she's, you don't speak Latvian. Why didn't Vitauts teach? And she was mad at Vitauts for not teaching me Latvian. And she took it out on me a little bit because it was like, your first generation should speak the language. So. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing experience. And I felt really uh, touched by the hospitality of my, my relatives who I did, had never met. And they were very friendly and very open and very kind. And so the whole thing was very, I, I left with a very positive experience of what Latvia was like. And am I correct in assuming that you living in Latvia now is the first time you've lived outside of your country of origin, your birth country? Absolutely. And the first time I lived outside my state, like I, I grew up in Utah, and then I had several teaching jobs around the state and I lived in uh, Omaha before I came here, which is the city uh, in Nebraska. It's about the same size as Riga. Yeah, city. And, yeah, and, uh, 
And during that time, I was doing lots of traveling in the United States. I was going to like Portland and, and Colorado and I went to San Francisco and, and, and many other places. And I was just thinking like, why do I live in Nebraska? I mean, my parents didn't choose that place. I didn't choose that place. It was kind of just the place they ended up because there was no other place to go. And I thought, man, I don't, I don't know if I fit there. Like it never, it, every, everywhere else I go, I went, I felt more like this is more my pace. This is more my style. These, these people I'm running into are more my, the way I am, the way I think, the way I feel. And so I just felt like I wasn't really meant to be there. It was more of just, you're here, so here, you, here you're gonna stay. And so that was a big, a big eye opener just to start traveling and going to other places. And going to Europe for the first time in 2005, like seeing, this myth busted that the United States is this beacon of technology and everything is better here. And I'm like, whoa, we spent time in Germany. I'm like, my gosh, these people are way ahead of us. And everything was like, uh, like futuristic, it felt like compared to compared to the United States. So that was a big part of it too, just seeing how other places were and realizing like this, you don't have to just live where you're born and raised. You can it's a big world. And then when somebody told me like, oh, you're a Latvian, you can get Latvian citizenship. I think my cousin Edgar uh, told me about that. I'm like, well, that's amazing because we're part of the EU and, and I can just live anywhere. And that's, yeah. So yeah, just open up this whole world. I don't know if that answered your question though. It did. It did. So it sounds like you already maybe felt like you wanted to find a new place to be. Can you talk a little bit about how exactly you made the decision or the, the layers of how you ended up actually moving across the world? Wow, it's hard to, I'm sure I wrote about it. I must have written a lot of journaling about it because it was such a big decision, but now it just seems so easy, like it just happened. But um, I think what happened was, so I was divorced for the second time. My mom died. My dad had dementia, was living with me, and I was taking care of him. My son was grown up and on his own. My daughter just grew up and she was on her own. And so I was just, I kind of looked at my life and I thought, what's keeping me here right now? Um, I have this house, I have this car, I'm taking care of my dad. But other than that, there was nothing really making me want to stay. And I know that that might sound kind of cold or harsh because I had lots of family and lots of friends, but it was really more of this feeling like stuck here, like nothing's happening. I'd been at my job, which was a great teaching job for 10 years. And I felt like that's long enough to be at the same job. And I really wanted a different job anyway. So I was thinking like, okay, if I'm going to look for a new career, I may as well look for a new place to live. And I'd already been thinking like maybe I'll go to Colorado or Portland or New Orleans or New York or Vermont or you know somewhere else just to live somewhere else and then when this idea like you can be a citizen and live here opened up I was like well that's cool and then my dad and I and my sister and her husband came to Latvia in 2016 um, and that was kind of a feeler for me I wanted to see you know what, what are the possibilities of me living here and uh, we had a great time and that's where I met Rita, who I'm married to now, and we met at the library, and she was like showing my dad old pictures of Smilton A and showing him around the library, and, and we kind of hit it off and started emailing each other. And um, so then after that trip, I talked to my cousin, Ansis, who, who lives in Tekova, and I just said, you know, I'm thinking about moving to Latvia. What do you think? And he's a business guy, and he's really smart, and he was telling me the, the pros and cons of it. But he said, you know, you can live with us. We have this guest house and you can stay here, but you've never been here in winter. And so that's that's something you don't know about. And I said, oh, okay, I'll come in the winter. And so he went to Florida to stay for two weeks with his family to visit Florida. And I came here for two weeks over the winter during winter break and stayed in this house out in the countryside and lived here for two weeks in the winter. And I'm like, this winter is nothing compared to Nebraska. It's like, this is weak. <laughs> and I felt like, oh, this is gonna be easy. You know, that, that, that gave me my final like, oh, you know, this isn't so bad. So um, yeah. And so then Rita and I kind of kept in touch and, and I decided like, you know, I'm better prospects here than, than anywhere back home and packed everything up, sold the house. got my, someone to take care of dad, gave my car to my nephew and, 
that I just kind of just do it. Yeah, rip that band-aid off kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I got the coolest thing though was like that I felt so good about was getting rid of all my debt. Like that's that's such a huge thing about this process was I never thought I'd be debt free. I never thought I'd be like just free and clear. And I realized like if I could sell the house and get what it's worth, I can pay off my student loans, I can pay off this, I can pay off that and just start fresh. And it's that was like amazing. Yeah. I feel, yeah. I, I mean, I'm just speaking from my personal opinion here, but I feel like that's a very American thing in, in terms Living of in the debt. credit cycle and, yeah, and, it's terrible. and was a big part of our experience moving here too, was, was getting rid of all of that and basically not, not having any of that tying you back um, right. there. You, you mentioned something interesting about the, the winter and that made me think about this idea of like similarities and differences and how mm -hmm. there are things that you might um, might think are going to be challenges, right? But again, you and I are from the Midwest where it's regularly negative, like 30, 40 and like yeah. crazy snow. And, and in comparison, Latvia has a really wind. Lots mild of wind. winter, right? Like a yeah. really mild, still winter and still cold, it's cold. but not yeah. not bitterly like i'm gonna die yeah. if i'm outside yeah. exactly <laughs> exactly and and so that made me think about so when you when you first arrived here we're kind of in that first little period what were the things that you were kind of noticing like did you expect certain things to be benefits and challenges what did they actually turn out to be because I think you come in with fresh eyes. So mm -hmm. you're probably observing things about Latvians and you're, you're observing things even about yourself and realizing mm -hmm. things about That's a what big your question. are. Big question. Um, I'll just go to the, like the big, the first thing that comes to mind, like at the challenge, it's a bureaucracy. Um, I have a friend who also uh, left America about the same time I did, she's in Israel. And both of us have been comparing like both of the systems, Latvia and Israel have these very bureaucratic structured systems where everything has to be exactly dotted and signed twice and this and that. And so, so I don't know if that's a European or just as part of the world, but different from the United States where um, a handshake and a smile can get you places, but here it's like, no, nope, you have to sign this, you have to sign this, you have to sign this. So one example was when I got my uh, cargo. So I, I, I had a crate built in America so I could put it on a ship and bring it here with everything that I wanted to bring here, um, which was kind of naive because if I could do it again, I'd probably pack different things. But um, at the time I thought this is gonna work. So I had the, the crate and then to get the crate out of shipping, it was like two months or more for it to get here. And then it got here and it went through the port and I had to, luckily my cousin offered to go because he had to go in and negotiate at the port to get it through customs. Um, they, don't, they didn't speak English and, and it would be hard to explain like what I was doing, what this was for. And I had to have like three pieces of paper showing that I was a uh, repatriate so that they wouldn't charge me for everything in the box and all that. And then they brought it to this other place and then I had to get a van uh, to move it, to get it uh, moved. And it was just like, everything was like this and this and this and one more thing. And then the box finally wouldn't fit in my cousin's van. So uh, I had to pay somebody to move it. And then I was going to keep it just in case I wanted to go home or just in case I'd use it for something. I ended up just giving it to the, the guy at the shipping dock because he really seemed to take a shine to the box. He said, if you don't want it, I'll take it. I said, all right, come get it, son. Uh, so that was cool. Um, and I'm lucky. I mean, I have to say that that I have a lot of support. I have, you know, Rita and I have my cousins and I have, uh, you know, people who know what they're doing. So I think it would be much harder if you didn't have that. So I would say that that was a big help. Um, the other part of your question, what's easier or what's like? Well, kind of I mean, I, it, it really contained multiple questions within yeah. it. So let me let me break it down. Um, maybe what did you expect to be a challenge that didn't actually end up being? Yeah, that's what that's what. Yeah. Thought? Um, I think getting work was was easier than I thought. But again, I, contacts helped because uh, I got a job at uh, Riga Gymnasium Two School. I had to do a lot of paperwork to get my 
credentials here. I had to get everything translated and signed and triplicate and this and that. Um, but I was able to show that I was an English teacher. And once that door opened, it was kind of like people want you to, to, to teach. And so, um, and my cousin warned me, like, people are going to want you. And I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, I don't know. And then like last minute, like I still didn't have a job and, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And then like three or four people like calling and saying, we need a teacher, we need a teacher, we need a teacher. So that was kind of nice to know that if nothing else worked, I can teach uh, English. And, and there's a lot of opportunities to do that here. Um, yeah. So being here, have you noticed anything about like your American culture that you brought with you that maybe wasn't as like on the top of your mind when you were just oh, tons, living huge. in Nebraska? Yeah, yeah, that's huge. I mean, you see how naive, I guess we are as Americans, like that, that to me that the, I, the opening of the cultural mind is such a big thing that's happened since I've moved here to look back and think like, you think this is the world that you live in because in the United States, it's so, everything is about the United States. Uh, the biggest example of that was with this, you know, COVID and the last election, I would see on Facebook people posting, oh, COVID is just a hoax to keep Trump from being elected. And I'm like, do you realize that COVID is here in Latvia and it's in all these other countries and all these other places? But to the, my American friends, they're thinking just, it's here. And it's about us and it's only focused here on us. And, and that's the kind of mentality that you don't realize because if you never leave or you go anywhere else, you just don't know, that's all you know. And so that was huge to like, just see like, wait, there's so many other people, so many languages, so many cultures, even here in Riga, you run into people from all over the world. And that's, uh, you, can't, you can't learn that any other way than, than, than going and, and meeting people. Um, and I'm still fairly new to that. Like there's a lot of people here who have been here for 10 years and they've met people from everywhere and they've traveled all over. Um, so that's big. And then also the opportunity of living here and you can go to the airport and pay 50 euros and be in Ireland or Italy or Germany or Belarus or wherever. And you can do that in the United States. You can't do that. You have to pay thousands of dollars to get out of the United States. Uh, to any other country except Mexico and Canada. And so it's just, that's the idea of living here that's so appealing is like you could just be anywhere else in just a matter of minutes uh, or a matter of hours, not minutes, but still it's, it's that kind of thing. Um, yeah, good. What, and so again, you're coming in from the outside and, and probably looking at Riga differently than, than the way Regans look at Riga, right? Um, oh, yeah. What were the the kind of um, defining things that you noticed about and and let's be real we're talking about Regans right because and and maybe you have some context for for broader Latvia but what were mm -hmm. things that you kind of noticed and maybe identified as Latvian cultural things like you saw them as patterns across different people. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the lack, well, these are complaints, I guess. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the biggest difference like that you see is this lack of uh, helpfulness in shops. I, I've heard a lot of people say this. And so it's, it's one of those things I noticed right away. Like you go into a store and you want to buy something and they're like angry at you because you're there. You get this feeling like, like you, they don't want you there. They don't want your business. And this isn't true for every place, but there are enough of them that it gets that kind of feeling like they don't understand this kind of customer service. Definitely you don't have the customer is always right. That is not a thing here at all. And I don't think anywhere in Europe, they have that kind of attitude except very touristy places. It's much more, you're here, we're a business, we're going to do business and, 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 and it'll happen the way it happens, but it's not like, oh, you know, this is American kind of, and, and I really think it's kind of phony in America too. They don't want you there any more than Latvians want you there. They just have to play the game because that's what it is. Um, the, and this is more of a Latvian thing, not just Riga thing, but I was so surprised at the number of dangerous things there are here in Latvia. And it's one of my favorite things about living here is like, uh, an example from Riga is like they have these uh, exercise parks and you can go and kill yourself on these exercise equipments and, and 
that's your fault. It's like, they don't care. There's no sign that says danger, you know, be careful or whatever. Um, we're in America, everything is, is they're worried about getting sued and there's gonna be a lawsuit. And so we have to be very, everything has to be padded and, and, and hidden away and, and, and whatever. And here it's much more like, yeah, if you wanna you're jump off that bridge. Yourself. Yeah, you're responsible for yourself. And it's, it's true for us in so many different, different ways. Like um, we're not gonna, and I think that, that that's just kind of the attitude. It's like you, you, you live your life and you, you gotta take the consequences and, and rewards. Um, what else? Oh. My favorite thing about Riga that that was that they don't realize is that compared to where I'm from, this is a great cycling city. And when I tell people that from Riga, they laugh at me because they think it's a horrible cycling city because compared to you know Amsterdam or, or Stockholm or other cities they visited, we're a terrible cycling city. But compared to any city I've been in the United States, it's like this is much easier to get around on a bike than uh, most of the places I've been. And it isn't about it's well, they have bike lanes and really wide sidewalks. That's a huge difference. Like these wide sidewalks where it's built for pedestrians. There's shops on every corner, there's stores in your neighborhood. You don't have to drive 10 miles to get to a supermarket and then park and, and buy everything for a month. That's much more day to day uh, expected to be walking culture, which is great. Um, and, and, that's, uh, and that's nice to, to have that experience. Um, which was which was something I didn't know about or expect, but it, it was it was really a nice surprise. Um, what else about Riga? Oh, culture is huge, and everyone I meet is cultured. Even the people who say they aren't cultured, compared to the average American, like they they go to operas and they they know theater and they know poetry and poetry. I mean, I, I just can't stress that enough. You walk down the street and you look at the street name, it's like, oh, who's Chakas? Oh, that's a famous poet. Who's this statue? Oh, that's a famous poet. Oh, this is a this is Barons who who named after the guy who did folklore, uh, who did the folklore poems. And it's like, these are the famous people. These are the people we admire are these cultural icons and touchstones, not generals or politicians or rich people, but the people who are cultural and, and, and bring us culture. And to me, that's such a big shift uh, and a, a welcome shift in, in, in I, I, ideology when it's not, about, uh, it's not about money and power, but it's about beauty and art. And, and, and there's so many artists and so many musicians in the city, it's just unbelievable. Well, so here's my last question, and it's a little bit of a doozy. <laughs> so if you need to think They're about They're called it, but I've been doozies, but yeah, go ahead. Um, do you feel now, three years in, do you feel a sense of belonging to this place? And if so, why? If not, why? Well, yeah, I'm lucky. Like I said, I have family, and now I'm married to a Latvian. And so it's kind of a built-in belonging when you have that. Um, and then my work, I, I feel so blessed to have the job I have. I'm doing this, uh, working for a Latvian startup company now, and I'm surrounded by Latvians. Their, their uh, cultural atmosphere at the workplace is incredible. And uh, they use English as their, their language because they want to be kind of an international company. And so it's, it's been really nice. They do speak some Latvian and you have these Latvian texts going on. Um, but I feel much more a part of the culture working with them than I did in the school systems because it's much more, um, we're much more a team and we work together. Where in the school, it always, it felt very much like your classroom, you do what you do. And then you might see another teacher, you might see another person. It was really nice with the students. Um, I really loved working with Latvian students, but I didn't have that, um, like, what's the word I'm looking for? Peer group or peer? whatever, peer. yeah. Yeah, and so now it's much better with with work because I have a team and I have people that I that I that I can can feel like I'm actually part of the team and a part of this group. And I don't want to sound mushy, but man, this I was just going back 2020. Everybody talks about what a horrible year it was, but I made more friends in 2020 than I have since I was like ever. I think college maybe is the only time it's been like that where I met you in Dallas and, and the book club and then all these other people, and it just felt like this. Uh, it feels much more like I have this momentum of people and, and this, this peer group and not so lonely and not so uh, uh, kind of just on my own, which is really nice. I think that's a huge, huge thing. And you got to thank the internet for that, which is 
sucks, but it's like, I got a Facebook for four months and I felt like I didn't know what was going on and now I'm back on and it's so much better because it's like all these events and especially with COVID and you see people and you do things. I'm in a movie club with, with people We watch Latvian movies and talk about them. And it's just like all these things that you can do um, despite the, the lockdown and not being able to go out and, and still have friends and meet people and talk. And it's just, yeah, it, it feels great. It feels very welcoming. And the other thing about moving somewhere, and I don't know if this works. This is a theory I have. I've been working on this theory about friendship um, for a long time, but when you grow up in a small town, you have friends who you grow up with because you grew up together and that was it. You didn't have a choice. You didn't have a say in it. And then when you work at a place, you have those friends because you work with them and you have to kind of get along with them. But here, when you just jump off the, the cliff and you end up in a completely new place, how do you gravitate towards people and meet people and, and find commonalities? And then I think it's much more, the friendships are more real because you're bonding, because there's a commonality in your existence, not just because you're from the same place or know the same people or whatever, but it's more of a, a, a thing. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, I guess time will tell. But it's, it's kind of a different process and it's, it's interesting to me to, to get out of that comfort zone and, and build something new from relatively nothing. So that's a little philosophy. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate you sharing so much about yourself and about your story. And I, it was really interesting because in some ways we share some similarities and in some ways we've had very different lives. Um, and that's part of why I want to have these conversations with folks. Um, so thanks again for being here. Yeah, thanks. It was very nice to open up and express some of that. I hadn't thought about it in a while. So yeah, 